Welcome to Off the Books, where we surf the uncharted waters of accounting, finance, risk, and wherever else the waves take us. This episode is brought to you by Workiva, the risk reporting and compliance platform that simplifies your complex work and creates order out of chaos. Check it out at workiva.com slash podcast. My name is Steve Soder, accounting enthusiast and Diet Coke aficionado. I'm looking forward to debiting a great conversation and having you with us. I'm also happy to have Catherine Sai joining me. Catherine, can you please tell the fine folks at home who you are? I'm not an accountant or a Diet Coke aficionado, but I like asking questions, learning new things, and writing about them later, so I'm here to learn. Well, thank you, Catherine. As we've watched the tragedy unfolding in Ukraine amid the heartbreaking images of refugees and destruction, we also got to thinking, how are impacted companies accounting for all of this? That's right, Steve, and to help us walk through it, we connected with Mike Rubel, an audit partner out of Los Angeles. And before we get to Mike, let me add for the audience that we in no way mean to ignore or minimize the terrible human cost inflicted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the devastating impact to its citizens. 100%, Steve, 100%. Let's now get to Mike Rubel. Well, we are delighted to have with us today uh, Mike Rubel, trust partner in PwC's audit practice, uh, I think to talk about some pretty interesting issues. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, as uh, as I'm sure everybody is aware, uh, of course, uh, significant events happening in both Ukraine and Russia, and we got to thinking, okay, well, what does this mean for accounting teams and financial reporting teams and uh, Mike, we're hoping maybe you could break it down for us and for our audience. What, what, what are companies thinking about right now as they work through what are probably some pretty serious issues? Yeah, thanks, Steve. So, yeah, I'm Mike. I'm an audit partner in our Los Angeles uh, Consumer Industrial Products Group. I started at the U.S. firm, also spent about four and a half years or five and a half years actually overseas with PwC in Switzerland. So the questions there have would be typical of most multinationals, which uh, first off is, is you know, wh- what do we do, right? We have operations in Russia. We have um, business units in Russia. We have plants in Russia. We have inventory in Russia. Like, where do we start? I, I think the, the first and foremost thing is really the people, right? I think we can deal with the accounting. Uh, we can deal with the numbers. But the most important thing uh, that our clients endure with, and us as a firm, and we had we have, you know, a couple thousand people in that area as well, is, is making sure that the people are safe. And, um, both in Ukraine, the surrounding countries, as, as well as our Russian employees. So that's really been at the top of, top of people's minds. So as you're taking care of employees, I'm sure there are some financial impacts from doing all of that. So how would you account for some of those impacts? What are some of the accounting issues people should be watching out for? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Catherine. So uh, I think we kind of see it in a couple of different buckets, um, whether we like it or not. Uh, there are a fair amount of companies that do have experience with this recently with, during COVID, right? We had s- similar types of situations where you had uh, closures of locations, either permanently or temporarily. Uh, you had advances of compensation to employees. Uh, you were inc- occasionally paying employees uh, who weren't working. So I think generally the, at a high level, the, the guidance is sort of a push and pull towards two sides fighting against each other. On the one hand is uh, if there's no service element, so if, if you're providing compensation to an employee, but they're not required to work anymore, the guidance would say, well, you need to recognize it up front. Right? There's, there's nothing they have to do to earn that money. And so you should be expensing it uh, right away. Alternatively, uh, on the other side, under GAP, you're not supposed to recognize expense um, now if there is going to be a future economic benefit from those services in the future. So that's sort of the, the pull side of it where, you know, you need to match your revenue with expenses. So you, you, you can't you don't want to recognize it too soon if they're going to be um, working in the future. I guess a good example would be, let's say you have a coffee shop and you, you go out and you say, hey, we're not going to, um, you don't have to come to work. Uh, we don't think it's safe for you to come to work. We're going to keep paying your salary. You don't have to do anything and you can go find another job and you're going to get this payment anyways. That would be an example of where the guidance would say you should probably recognize that front. Where if you were to say, well, don't come into work now, but we 
we don't want you to get another job because sometime in the next six months we, we might open and we want you to be available. That would be an example of compensation you wouldn't want to recognize early and you want to spread that out over the over the period. So that's kind of the push pull on the on the employee compensation. Mike, one of the other questions that I was wondering is you've kind of got two sort of scenarios there. And 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 first and probably the most critical, of course, is you know, you're in Ukraine, you're in Kiev. If I have physical assets there, obviously their their value certainly will have been impacted, you know, by the war. But then on the flip side, um, if I had operations in Russia, you know, customer facing stores or whatever, and now I've pulled out, you know, my assets are basically idle. They're kind of sitting around. I may have no idea what I'm going to go back in. And that could be months or I guess potentially years. Who knows? How are companies thinking through those two things where the value of something basically changed almost overnight and accounting certainly doesn't happen overnight. So I'm wondering how are companies thinking about that and just kind of grappling with the reality of keeping the books uh, clean, as it were. So before Mike answers that question, let me break in here and explain impairment, which is a term that we'll use a lot in this episode. In a nutshell, impairment means that an asset's value has decreased below the value on its books. Okay, so let's say I have a pickup truck for my business and my ledger has it valued at $20,000. But then it gets in a wreck and is now only worth half of that, so I have a $10,000 impairment? Yeah, exactly. Now, of course, like everything in accounting, there is a lot more to that example, but you get the idea. In that case, you would recognize a $10,000 impairment, which would increase your expenses for that period and would decrease the truck's carrying value on your books. And this concept applies to pretty much any asset, whether it's a truck, a building, inventory, or something else. All right, with that in mind, let's get back to Mike. You obviously have some impairment considerations. If you have a damaged um, you know, factory, you also are going to have to think about, am I going to be able to come back? Uh, do I write off the whole thing? Do I change its useful life? Um, or you know, do I just have an impact from you know, certain cash flows with regards to, mm-hmm. I, my, I have a sole supplier and that supplier is gone, or my biggest customer is, I have no idea when they're gonna order again. Those are sort of the, the, the issues you're, you deal with. And as you first start with, okay, what assets, what tangible assets, so AR, inventory, what kind of those assets do I have related to the business unit? Um, and you go through that process for accounts receivable. So that's sort of step one. Step two is you then start looking at your tangible assets. So this is your property, plant, and equipment. So if we go back to the examples we were talking about before, if you have a plant or an asset in the country that's destroyed, you clearly expense it right away. If that plant has uh, uh, had some damage to it, uh, but it's still usable, usually you would then say, okay, do I have some sort of impairment? Um, or do I just need to adjust the depreciable life, right? If, for example, everyone's left um, the, the building and they may come back in the future uh, in, in a relatively short order, you know, and that plant I had for was originally going to expense it over 10 years, you know, do I now think I need to shorten that to five, for example, given the changes in the, that are going on? And then lastly, you do your goodwill impairment test. So you kind of do all that in a certain order um, uh, under the guidance. And, and that's kind of the framework you would walk through, Steve. Steve, we keep talking about impairment and steps. What do I need to know? Well, we're still talking about that same example of the truck, except as you can imagine, some of this stuff can be very subjective and potentially manipulated. Like, what if you fixed that truck with shoddy parts to save money, but then the truck wouldn't last as long? What Mike's talking about here are specific accounting rules so that companies use all of the same framework as they recognize impairments and to try to minimize anybody from doing anything shady. That's helpful. Let's get back to Mike. And it's challenging, right? Because a lot of we can say here, we can sit here and and talk about the the guidance and how you're supposed to do it. Getting all these inputs with all this uncertainty is really the challenge. But yeah, it's it's definitely not as easy as the book as the textbooks for sure. Well, that was going to be my question: is how spot on does the asset impairment have to be? Yeah. So generally, materiality is plays a big factor into this. So the 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 impairment has to be materially correct. Um, when you're dealing with impairments, you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. You're dealing with a lot of management judgments. Um, I put my auditor hat on and I'm always looking for objective evidence, which is uh, you know, always challenging to get. I mean, ultimately it is a judgment. I think the advice I think we, we give to our accountants um, 
is make sure you're getting outside of the account, accounting finance organization to get some of these inputs. Uh, so your sales folks, they're going to know what customers are still buying, who's changed their buying pa- patterns. Your supply chain folks are going to know what is the, the price of our inputs? How, how has that changed? Or how is the supply, um, the shipping costs and receiving costs changed? Making sure you get those data inputs into the model is, is going to come up with a much more accurate figure for what you think these valuations are worth as opposed to, you know, a, you know, a Mike, an accountant sitting in a room guessing. Um, so hopefully that answers the, the question. Materiality. <laughs> Hi, Steve. It's me again. I think I understand what Mike means when he says materiality, but I know that determining materiality can be tricky. What do I need to know? So when Mike says materiality, he's really talking about a dollar amount applicable to a certain thing that a reasonable investor would care about. So let's go back to that truck example. Let's say that the damaged truck is only one of a thousand trucks you have in your business. Well, I don't know many investors who are going to care about the $10,000 for a single damaged truck. So that clearly would not be material. But if it was your only truck and the only way you could stay in business, well, then an investor is definitely going to care. It's actually both a quantitative and a qualitative determination. Is that helpful? Surprisingly, it is. Let's get back to the conversation with Mike. Well, and it's almost, um, you know, it's almost like... It's a bit of a moving target initially, and and I suppose, Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if the conflict, let's say, stabilizes, and let's all hope that it does before the end of the year, then I think that would probably make it very easy for accounting teams to, to, to dial into some level of accuracy. But I'm picturing, you know, heaven forbid the conflict lasts beyond 2022. Well, I have a period ending, presumably at the end of the year. Now I may have to make those determinations that would be subject to an auditor like yourself. And and, and again, that may be somewhat difficult to do as it kind of was in the early days of COVID simply because I don't know how this thing is going to play out. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And uh, no one has a crystal ball. Um, you somewhat have to deal with what you know as of the date you're making these estimates. So for example, one of the things we talked about a lot is um, is kind of this worst case scenario for companies U.S. companies in Russia, which is nationalization, which has happened and, you know, happened in Venezuela. It's happened um, you know, before before my career started. It, it happened more frequently in in sort of the, the, the 60s, 70s and 80s. And, and to clarify, when you say nationalization, meaning that the government basically comes in and says, hey, these are no longer owned by you as a private business. We are now going to take ownership of those assets. I mean, simply said, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. That, that's exactly right. And and that's at risk. I, I think in, in Russia, there's some bills currently in parliament to do that. Um, it could happen in the Ukraine as a, as a country recovers from war. You know, to Steve's point, hopefully this turns around and they begin their rebuilding process. But you see this in countries rebuilding. Um, and that's an example of as of as of now, no one knows what's going to happen with regards to that. So you kind of have to go with what you, you know, what you know, as of the date Um and, you know, as of now, it, it looks like there, there isn't really a, a significant end for the conflict. And um, so this, that's kind of where you have to position yourself as of, as of, you know, you're closing your fiscal Q1s. We are going to close the first half of this conversation with a short message from our sponsor. We'll be right back. Today's episode of Off the Books is brought to you by Workiva. In this modern world, musicians can make money in several ways. And while it may seem simple, dear listener, it's actually quite complicated. Seriously, just Google how musicians make money. It's bananas. For the sake of time, we're only going to mention a few. They have live performances, merch sales, and streaming royalties. And while there are always exceptions, most artists aren't making a living redoing their work. They're paying the bills by focusing on the new. New tours, new albums, new hoodies. But as you may have guessed, we're here to discuss the exception. Recently, one musician's been seeing success redoing her work. You might know her all too well. These re-recorded albums are making quite the splash in the music industry, breaking new records, re-engaging fans, and making that money. But redundant work in your reporting processes simply isn't benefiting you, is it, dear listener? If you're wasting valuable time copying and pasting, reformatting data, or emailing back and forth revisions, Workiva can help. Automate all that awful, useless copy and pasting, and spend more time actually doing your job. You know, 
doing what you love and being the rock star you are. Workiva and you, it's a love story. Just go to workiva.com slash podcast. That's W-O-R-K-I-V-A dot com slash podcast. And say yes. Welcome back to our conversation with Mike Rubel, talking about the accounting impacts of the war in Ukraine. It's interesting to think about, you know, accounting teams having to make um, potential guesses and informed guesses, but potential guesses about, well, we think the conflict, you know, latest intelligence is that the conflict is going to last this long. And then after that, it's going to take that long to rebuild. And I don't mean to make light of what is obviously a very tragic situation, but, you know, some accounting determinations are going to require future estimates. And at least in this case, you sort of have to have an assumption of, How long is this going to last and how bad is it going to get in order to accurately make those? I mean, I'm just picturing myself in accounting, you know, looking at latest intelligence reports and, you know, here's what the boots on the ground are saying. That's a very odd situation, I think, for, you know, accounting teams to find themselves in. Yeah, that's right. And it was very similar to where we were in, you know, I remember, you know, closing Q1 of 2020 and where we were with COVID, right? And it was the same same situation where no one had any idea of where what COVID was going to do, and um, what was next. I think you know outside of uh, outside of just the accounting, you also have you know if you're a public company, have executives out there providing guidance, right? And they're also one not not, not know you know where where it's going to go. So it is a management judgment, and, and that's why I think the advice we generally give is just get outside of accounting and finance as much as you can to get those data, those independent data points. Um, and then if, if you're, you know, a, a, again, a public company or, or a company that provides MD&A, then just disclosing how you got to your conclusion, right? How, how, did, you, how did you decide what should be impaired, what shouldn't be impaired, um, and providing, you know, foreshadowing language if you're worried about something in the future that's really uncertain. I mean, that's, that's generally how companies would deal with that amount of uncertainty is disclosures. Steve, are you tired of these questions? Because Mike was first talking about accounting guidance, but now I think he's talking about another type of gui- guidance. Plus, when he said disclosures just now, was he talking about 10Ks? So, Catherine, you know more than you think. Uh, yes, at the beginning of our conversation, Mike was talking about accounting guidance, which are the rules that accountants use to record things. But just now, he's been talking about earnings guidance meaning the estimates that companies will give to investors about their expected revenues or maybe their profitability, things like that. So what he's saying just now is that for things like COVID or the tragedy in Ukraine, it can be really hard for companies to give that guidance on future revenue or profitability because there's just so much uncertainty. And whenever there's uncertainty like that, you definitely want to disclose all of those uncertainties to investors in places like 10Ks, 10Qs, or earnings releases. That's really what he means there. We've talked a lot about uncertainty, which kind of naturally goes into the topic of insurance. So do companies have insurance for incidents like this? I think generally most of our clients do. I would kind of break it into two two kind of groups of insurance. One is for losses of tangible assets. Um, So factories, warehouses, inventory, you know, physical types of assets they own. And then the other one would be business interruption insurance um, that many of our, our clients also have for these types of events. And uh, generally speaking, what I've seen is the, our clients often will get some sort of communication from, from, um, from the insurance provider uh, saying, yes, this was a covered claim. Um, yes, you have a valid policy. And, and that's what they then use before they book any sort of receivable for, for that. Uh, business interruption is a little bit different and because in business interruption, it also covers not only the uh, uh, covering costs, but it also has usually in, there's a margin included in it. So you're going to get this business interruption insurance that's not just going to cover um, your direct costs. It's going to include a profit. That all said, um, most insurance contracts uh, for many things, including houses and cars and of our, of, that we own, uh, on a personal standpoint, they generally have you know acts of war, or force majeure elements in them, which invalidates the contract based on those criteria. Um, you know, I, I'm not an insurer; I can't speak on behalf of the industry by any extent. Of, uh, but you know, we that I, I would think in this situation that is a risk, right? Um, that 
the the losses may not be covered by your account by your insurer given their nature so i think heading into this quarter i think it'd be even more important if you do have actual losses um uh, to have your insurer uh provide you in writing that that this is a covered claim that the assets are covered that you know that that they've gone through their process because i think you'll probably run into issues where they will um they will view potentially this as non-covered claims due to the nature of their of their cause. It's always the insurance companies. They're always trying to find a way out. Yeah, well, that's why our rates are so cheap, right? So <laughs> Well, it, it not to geek out too much on the accounting, but I would say that that just as an observation for our listeners is that as, as as we've heard, there's a lot of uncertainty with respect to what you can actually recognize, what you can record versus other things that might be out there that could impact things one way or the other, but that I can't record. And that's where the disclosure saying, hey, I can't record this or recognize in this book in my books, but these other things are hanging out there that you, you know, financial statement user should be aware of because that might change your perception of, you know, where we're at as a company in terms of our financial position. That was very geeky. You're right. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> Are there any other accounting issues that we're missing that companies should be watching out for? So, Catherine, before Mike answers, let me provide a quick explanation of a term he's about to use, which is consolidation. As you would expect, large companies are often made up of smaller companies that are consolidated or put all together for a financial reporting purpose. But as Mike will explain, if you sell or lose control of one of those smaller companies, well, then you would deconsolidate it and no longer include that company in your financial reporting. All right, with that in mind, let's get back to Mike. Uh, yeah, it, it really depends on, on your business. I mean, I think kind of the other things we've been thinking about are um, consolidation. I think there are certain, certain types of industries where uh, there are threats of e either nationalization, which we talked about before, um, or just simply losing control of the business. Um, and I, I, the, the best sort of way I've, I've seen this described uh, in the past is if management really no longer has the ability to exert control over the subsidiary, um, that's when you need to think about, do I really, should I continue to consolidate this entity in my accounts or do I need some sort of other accounting for it? And the way that's demonstrated is, is things like, being able to pull profits out of the business. So you think you have a subsidiary in Russia and it's earning profits um, and you want to pull the money out of that profit they're making, pull it back to the center and redeploy the capital. If you can't do that, uh, then, you know, that's, I mean, that is the most important part about owning the subsidiary is being able to pull the profits out. So if you can't do that, that's, that's a problem, right? You know, other things are, um, you know, you can't contact local management there. They won't provide financial information to you anymore. Um, uh, political uncertainties. T uh, you, we've seen a lot of, of, you know, certain things done uh, by various jurisdictions with related to, you know, embargoes and, and asset, uh, asset um, forfeitures and, so, and, and those types of things. Well, certainly a lot to consider. And, uh, you know, I think it's interesting to just hear from you, Mike, how these very critical and, and, and troubling and chaotic world events actually sort of make their way into the books and records of, uh, you know, companies that, that naturally have to account for, record, and, and disclose all these things. So, uh, again, hope that we don't have to deal with these issues for much longer and, of course, that the, uh, the conflict uh, resolves uh, very soon. Yeah, that's yep. Yeah, that that's great. And as we started with, you know, I I think most of our clients and and us, I think, have really tried to lean into the people side of it, uh, and really um, d deal with that as the most important thing. And and as mentioned, the the accounting is important, but um, you know, the the, the emphasis has got to be on the people first. So, yeah, thoughts and prayers with them. Well, we generally try to lean into uh, the people side of things uh, at the end of our podcast with a closing question of the day. This one is going to be uh, very boring um, so that we don't make too much uh, light or humor of uh, this topic. Mike, have you seen any good movies lately? Um, so it, was, it has been busy season, so a movie watching has been somewhat limited. Uh, we did... Um, I guess my wife and I did see Myrtle on the Nile uh, a couple of weeks ago. That was actually pretty good. Um, I, I 
I think it's somewhat like an asset impairment. It's, it's, it's somewhat of a whodunit mystery. And sometimes when you're dealing with asset impairments, you, uh, you never know who's, who's, whose fault it was. And so, uh, you know, it was, it, was a good, it was a good flick. Whodunit. It's the auditor's fault. It's always the auditor's fault. Well, I'm Googling <laughs> murder on the Nile, and it says it's called death on the Nile. Oh, yeah. See, that's how much I was paying attention to. It was called Death on the Nile. <laughs> Apparently You're it was right. a really movie. <laughs> Even the title was a mystery. <laughs> it sounds promising. I'll have to check it out. Definitely. I, I probably I probably just gave it away that I said it was a murder <laughs> on the Nile. It was not a death by natural causes on the Nile. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. Well, Mike, we appreciate you coming by and joining us. Uh, again, it'll be interesting to uh, to see how this plays out. And totally agree, thoughts and prayers are obviously with everybody who is just going through a horrific experience uh, in Ukraine. And we, again, appreciate your insight. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Catherine. Well, that wraps up our conversation with Mike Rubel. Big thanks to him for dropping by and explaining these issues for us. And thanks to you, dear listener, for surfing along with us. Our hearts are with the people of Ukraine and the horrific tragedy they have endured. I'm Catherine Sy, that was Steve Soder, and this has been Off the Books presented by Workiva. Please subscribe, leave a podcast review, tell your buddies if you liked the show, and feel free to drop us a line at offthebooks at workiva.com. Surf's up, and we'll see you on the next wave. Mm-hmm.